Hi, Internet. This is the uh, March 10th Jupyter Lab and Notebook Developers Meeting. Uh, I guess I'll kick it off today talking about uh, the refactoring taking place to break the repository into multiple packages within the same repository. And the reason for this is to make it e more easily consumable by third party authors, as well as um, to make our extension mechanism work better in that uh, you're no longer importing individual modules, you import a whole package, and that makes our uh, the, the the hoisting and deduping algorithm that we'll use to create the final bundle, uh, it'll make that work, as opposed to trying to do it at the, at the module level that we originally tried to do and ran into all kinds of problems that we're now trying to address. Um, in the process of doing this, we're uh, restructuring where, where folders are, uh, to, since it's no longer this blob of files that we can import from. Trying to so Darren and I have been working this week to to make a, a more coherent folder structure and and to reflect what packages will actually release uh, that makes sense to be consumed. Um, we're pretty far along in in, in doing that. There's all, uh, we 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 know what what else needs to be done. We're just turning the crank on that at this point. Uh, just moving folders around. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I, so I I think it, it took a little bit longer because we took a step back. Um, we Chris uh, let him talk about that. Uh, I'll let I'll let Darren and and Chris talk about what what, what other work that, uh, they were doing that uh, we uh, prioritized to get done first. And, and um, so it, so all that all that means that what is that it's taking a little bit longer for us to get to 18.0. But we're um, I originally tried to to do the whole conversion at once and and realized that was a bad idea. Let's take a step back and think about what the packages need to look like. So we're taking our time trying to do it right. Um, and we're making some progress there. Uh, the other thing I did this week was um, uh, converted our extension builder Webpack plugin to be compatible with 2.0, um, so we can move forward with that. Uh, that that's ready to go. It's fully tested, um, and uh, that's it for me. I guess uh, Darian is logical to come next. I had a question. Yeah, got a question actually, Steve. Is uh, 0 0.18 is that our beta release? Is that what we're no. considering? Oh, it, okay. it's a, it's a, it's a major step to get there though. Um, okay. um, yeah. Steve, can you can you comment we'll on oh. can what you comment is. on uh, on what this restructuring will mean in practice for extension authors? Uh, it means they to... they will they will instead of requiring Jupyter Lab as a, a giant blob, they'll require the pieces they need um, and that they actually import f files from. Uh, so the, there'll be more granular imports, and it'll make uh, our deduping algorithm work better for them. So it'd be easier for both the extension author and the consumer um, by doing it this way. Okay. Let me just and, ask and a follow-up question here with beta. Um, we were aiming for beginning of March. Is that uh, still realistic, or should I update our our board? Yeah. I guess the answer to that is it, it depends. Um, what we what, what we still what we want to consider beta, um, <laughs> okay. and there's still some discussion we need to have about that. So maybe maybe uh, after we have all done go around, we can we can talk more about that. Okay, sounds great. Yeah, Thanks. I was actually going to propose a separate meeting to talk about what we call the call the beta. Um, probably not this meeting is probably not the appropriate place. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely need to set that up uh, and talk okay. about that. Yep, and I would like for Fernando and Brian to be there. Um, so they can hear it directly. Can we do that early, as early as possible next week? Yeah, I'll talk to them right after this call. So um, try to get that set up. Um, Steve, is there uh, any problem with using the new extension builder with the old package? Like, is, is moving to Webpack 2 going to make things incompatible? Well, yes, it'll be a, a uh, a well, effectively a major version bump. So it won't affect what was already there. Um, but so the the new version of Jupyter will use it. So any any new all the components will have to. to yeah, the, the components for the 0 0.18 will have to use the newer release of Extension Builder that is not yet released. But it, it okay. yeah it, it won't it won't automatically install an old versions of Jupyter Lab. Okay, and I think Ian maybe uh, another thing to mention in answer to your question is essentially. Uh, if you were compatible with 0.17, you probably just need to update your imports. Uh, is that, I mean, that's the real practical consequence of, of a lot of this, right, Steve? 
Right. Mo most things are just moving between folders. There's some core utilities um, that, uh, so the like a the calling a dialogue has changed slightly. I I I, I had last week gone through um, and taken the action of uh, refactoring what we call our, our core core utilities and, and application utilities that are used throughout the application. And one of the one of the things I did was I, I looked at our dialogue and it really was a mishmash because uh, it, it started out as a simple uh, function call and then it grew into a widget, but it was sort of a hybrid. It wasn't really doing um, either very well. So I refactored that. So the API for, for dialogues has changed slightly, but in general, uh, it should be just import changes um, in the repo. And Ian's probably only using dialogue, so his life's going to be difficult. <laughs> Moving to 0.17 is, I think, is the toughest because then you're changing phosphor versions too. So that changes right. how your signals work and stuff. Right. No, I, I was running into some uh, uh, deduplication errors, but I'm sort of holding off on sinking too much time into it until it's sort of uh, calmed down a little bit on that front. Yeah, and helping Same with, with those deduplication errors is, uh, is the whole reason why we did that right. phosphor. Package refactor because there was so not not only not only is it easier to deduplicate but there were some very very subtle edge cases that you could end up in that would just break everything and it would be completely undebuggable about why it would break and so we, yeah that's basically the impetus for all of this was right. preventing that condition from arising in production code. Okay. Um... One of the features we've wanted before beta is the application uh, state restoration when you refresh the page and stuff. And we've been progressively adding more and more uh, restoration capability. Right now, we're basically at like 95%. So with the new ability of the doc panel to save layout that Chris released in Phosphor, um, this week, I tied that to the main doc panel of Jupyter Labs, so it does retain your layout um, in addition to refreshing all the tabs that you had open. There is uh, There are some cases where it doesn't save right now, but they're small and there's a new, there was a just, Chris just released a new version a couple hours ago that, um, I can plug in to to get those gaps as well. Um, so yeah, in addition to the reorg stuff that that Steve was talking about, that's what I've been working on this week, and um, it's uh, it's already out in the wild. But um, yeah, one more one more uh, PR should probably uh, bring that up to the level where we want it to be for beta. After that, I I would just ask people to test it because. It's finicky. I've tried really hard to make it super fault tolerant so that if the data is somehow corrupted, if something changes, if you go in and maliciously try to make my life hard, hopefully nothing bad happens. Um, and the worst thing that just happens is one of your tabs from before doesn't open up. But the idea is to accept really faulty data coming in and try to save really good data going out. So take a look. Uh, that's it for me. Yeah, so, uh, so on my end, uh, as Terry mentioned, um, we got a Saber Store doc layout stuff um, done. Just released another version uh, this morning, which adds a layout modified signal to the doc panel, which is emitted um, whenever the configuration of the layout may have changed, um, so that you know if you're trying to basically auto save on changes or that kind of stuff. Um, that signal helps you do that. That signal is also emitted in a collapsed asynchronous fashion um, for two reasons. So if you do a bunch of ads all synchronously to, to the to the doc panel, you only get one emit of that signal. Um, so that's why it's collapsed. Uh, why it's done asynchronously so that if you immediately so that if you immediately call save layout after uh, in, in the handler of that signal, um, the layout itself will have already updated its geometry to what it should be based on your modification. So you're getting fresh data rather than data that hasn't yet updated. Um, so that went out this morning. Um, earlier in the week, um, I had to move um, the token class from the application module to the core utils module um, so that some of the tests that Steve uh, was doing, um, or sorry, so that 
the packages that aren't necessarily plugins that only depend on Phosphor widget or something like that can provide a token that can be used by an application without requiring all the Phosphor application dependency stuff. Um, so that was moved. That was a, a API breaking change. And so I had to release a 0 0.2 version of application and a 0 0.2 version of um, so that so that required a 0 0.2 version of application, which went out this morning. Um, more on the widget side, um, I also spent time updating uh, the behavior of how the absolute layout works, lay, layouts work in terms of how they compute their automatically compute their own size limits. Um, so previously, if you were to put a bunch of widgets in a box panel, the box panel would automatically compute both its minimum size and its maximum size based on the aggregates of the size limits of its children. So if like, say you had a whole bunch of, you had four widgets, each of them had a max width of 400 pixels, then the max width of that box panel would be automatically computed and enforced as 400 pixels. Um, that did cause some confusion for people uh, like historically that were coming into Phosphor that thought they could just set the maximum size of a box panel independently and then found it would be overridden during the layout computations. Um, but once I explained what was going on, um, they, were, they were fine with it. However, um, I was recently having a conversation with Brian about adding single document mode to the doc panel uh, to address one of the concerns of lots of lots of the JupyterLab users where they're working on a bunch of documents and they're like, I actually just want to see this one document more or less full screen or just focus on this one document for right now. Like you could think of it like a, a Zen mode for, for the doc panel. Um, and so, but in the, in the process of, of implementing that, definitely what some people are going to want to do is limit the maximum width of a notebook for example, so that, yeah, it's taking up all the height that can, but I actually don't want it to be wider than like 400 pixels. And so supporting something like that um, previously wasn't possible because the doc panel would compute its maximum size based on the aggregates of, of, its, of its children. And so that would fail in that case to allow the doc panel to be sized larger than the maximum width of the document when you have it in single document mode. So that caused me to basically go back and rethink how we're doing all of these automatic size computations for max sizes only. And what I decided was that the panels, the absolute layout panels should keep, continue to compute, automatically compute their minimum size based on the aggregates. But they should always be, they, they shouldn't automatically compute their maximum size. So the maximum size should be up to the user. It defaults to infinity, but if you want to reset it in CSS, um, you can. That fixes the surprise that new users have. And it also allows us to implement the case of the single document mode. However, that introduces its own new set of problems, uh, which is like if I've got a panel that is sized larger than the maximum sizes of all of its child widgets, like how do we align the child widgets within that free space that is now available in the panel? Because the panel is larger than all of the children. And so I had to go back and add the concept of horizontal and vertical alignment to widgets um, so that the various layouts could then use these horizontal and vertical alignment parameters to align the widget within its allocated space, even though it doesn't take up all that allocated space. So that's in that feature is implemented. Um, there's a, uh, a bunch of, there's two attached properties added to the layout namespace. Uh, it's horizontal alignment and vertical alignment. Um, you can set those on a widget and for layouts that support it, which would be uh, box panel, stack panel, flip panel and dock panel, uh, if there is more space than can be consumed by the widget, the horizontal and vertical alignment control how the widget is aligned within that dead space. Um, so that's implemented um, and that's out and it's in the wild now. Um, and now I can actually go back and actually implement single document mode in the dock panel um, because I basically needed that, needed that horizontal and vertical alignment in order to do that. So that's the kind of state of the world there. Um, document mode should be difficult to implement it just required some legwork uh, to get to the point to be able to implement it. So, quick question: um, I noticed that you implemented essentially some of the alignments in uh, that Flexbox has, uh, but you left out the space between instead of uh, and just implemented the space around. Uh, yes. I was just curious if there was a reason for it, or if you were just simplifying things, or uh, just to simplify things. Um, if if people want uh, a space between, like. The equivalent of space around is justify, which is what I'm calling it. Um, if people want that and they're looking for it, then, then we can add it. Um, it's just another, just another alignment flag to pass to. Yeah, that can it's be not, implemented. It's not a huge change. It's not like this where you're completely rearchitecting everything. It's just adding another calculation or another and another flag. Yeah, in this case. Um, 
And I don't have a use case for it. I was just curious. Does I it seem I like you were? No, I actually, I, you're right. No, I did. Um, I did go down that road and thinking about how hard it would be to do. Um, and, and it is actually a little bit more implementation effort than what's there now. Um, and the reason is because the way our the layout computation engine, the way the box engine works, um, is that it's. So the way Justify is implemented is that I just divvy up the space that's available to all of the layout boxes and allow them to grow larger than they need to be. Um, and then I take care of the layout item to control the alignment of, of the widget within its allocated layout box, which is which which is larger than what was computed. Um, and so it's a little bit more work. So basically implementing Justify, which is space between, kind of fell out from the wash. That was a very easy thing to do. Um, there's a bit more implementation complexity to implement the, the space around option. It's not impossible, um, but I didn't see it as a strong enough use case to just have it out of the gate um, versus what we already have. So if there if, if a use case comes up, we can add it. If not, then there was no sense to implement it because it was a bit more complex than what's there. Steve, can I go next? Yeah. Am I up? <laughs> uh, we uh, just been uh, uh, helping any fallout from IPy Widgets 6 release. I moved IPy Widgets. It's now compatible to 0.17 in the PR, uh, but I held off on merging because it looked like 0.18 was imminent, and I thought, well, that'll require another switching around, changing, uh, importing stuff. Uh, from Jupyter Lab, um, we might go ahead and just release. If if 0.18 is still a few days out, we might just go ahead and merge the IPy widget 0.17, basically the new move to the new phosphor. Uh, I, it, I was sort of waiting to see how 0.18 came out. Is it going to be another couple of days? Do you think? Um, like I said, we, we know exactly what we're going to do at this point, but there's just so much to do. I mean, there's, <laughs> um, yeah, so optimistically, it would be a full working day, uh, but it's hard to say. Okay. Well, maybe you'll get it done before I get to merging FI widgets. We'll, we'll see. Um, and then I've been working with uh, Chris on sort of various widget based and Jupyter Lab based workflows, just brainstorming lots of ideas for how to have this, uh, have a lot of this work uh, suit a, a computational modeler. It's all for me. Okay, I guess Ian, you're up next. Sure, so I've, I've been, uh, I've been playing around with how uh, how something like a model database might work that uh, different types of document models could consume um, and just seeing, trying to see what kind of changes to the code base that might, on the model level, that might, uh, that might entail. Um, and this is after a, a lengthy discussion that Chris and Brian and I had last Friday. Um, in particular, I've been playing with uh, something that's come up a couple times, which is, which is the idea of having a uh, notebook cell order being uh, being um, implemented not as a list of cells, but rather a list of cell IDs, and then a map that has, this, and then a mapping uh, from those unique cell IDs to a cell object. Uh, and that's come up in a couple different contexts. And one of the things that winds up being subtle about that is, what do you do uh, as soon as this? Is, these are uh, a real-time model, and you have asynchronous things where the, maybe you insert a cell, but the uh, actual cell content hasn't come in yet and trying to get those subtle subtleties right. Um, so uh, that's something that um, I'm playing around with different implementation ideas yet, but I don't have a, a full story on. Um, and I think we, Steve, we wanted to loop you in on more of those discussions later, so maybe that's another, uh, maybe that's another separate meeting we can set up. Yeah, no, that sounds good. Um, and yeah, thanks for running this to ground. It's a tricky problem. <laughs> <laughs> running this to ground? Is that an Air Force expression? That sounds like <laughs> the end of a flight. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> 
okay. <laughs> I don't know anymore. <laughs> Oh, is that all you had, Ian? Uh, yeah, that's the main thing. There's been the Doctathon going on in Berkeley this week. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And uh, Jamie, do you have anything from the program management side? Um, well, um, have you guys been filling out the notes for today's meeting? <laughs> <laughs> Please do so. The link's in the chat. Um, also, we uh, worked with um, we had an accessibility clinic earlier this week, uh, March 6th, uh, where we had a, um, a woman, a blind woman who works in the accessibility office and consults with different groups on campus on accessibility and software tools used um, on campus. And of course, Jupiter is used in Data 8, the freshman data science uh, curriculum. Um, so she went through the notebook and Jupiter Hub um, in particular, um, you know, using a screen reader. And it was really, it was fascinating um, to watch her go through, um, go through the notebook and, and to start up a Jupyter Hub, the server. Um, but there may be some requests from the Jupyter Lab team. Um, once we get the notes back from them, they'll submit uh, recommendations for, you know, things that we need to do to make the notebook and, and Jupyter Hub uh, more accessible. Um, we don't have those notes yet, but once we have them, we'll certainly pass them on to the team and um, we'll talk more about, you know, what, how we want to proceed. It didn't seem super major. I mean, she was actually really happy with, with, with the notebook and how Jupyter Hub um, was designed. It worked really well for her. Um, there were a little, a couple of snags that um, seemed like they could be um, fixed, um, hopefully easily. Um, but that would be your guys's call. Um, so hopefully we'll have those in the next week or so, and then uh, we can we can talk about the the, the results here or in a separate uh, meeting. I think one last thing I'll bring up: uh, tell everyone you know, their brothers or sisters or moms and dads, grandmas, grandpas, dogs, to submit proposals to JupyterCon. Uh, the deadline's what Tuesday, I think Tuesday at midnight Eastern. Friday. Yeah, oh. are we doing coding oh. for? Or are we doing a submittal, a submittal for Jupyter Lab? Yeah, we should do a tutorial uh, for Jupyter Lab. It, we should certainly do a talk, and um, and I think we should do a tutorial on writing uh, widgets and extensions for Jupyter Lab. Yeah, I th I think in our meeting earlier this week, Carol thought that uh, Jupyter Lab tutorial would be a wonderful thing to provide uh, to the community. Um, and we're certainly looking for more tutorials, um, so that would be a perfect candidate. Can we can we talk about it more on Monday? It's a bad day for me to talk about it, but I'd love to flush something out with somebody on Monday. Yep. Yep. Cool. Anything the one, else? The one, okay. the one problem I think we'll have with submitting a tutorial is that essentially they want the entire tutorial done before registration opens and you know Jupyter Lab is going to look nothing like it looks today <laughs> between the time that registration the opens will. and the time of the conference what the front end will the it's the yeah, back end that will that's true so the today. tutorial of how to use Jupyter Lab probably won't change very much but the extension mechanism right uh, might change a lot so that's going to be I guess the tricky part we're writing a tutorial anyway. Dave? Anything else? We don't. Yes, that's it. Okay. Bring us home. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming to the ground, Steve. <laughs> okay. Do your spring break if you're having such a thing. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys.